Welcome to BNAP Today, Friday, October the 30th, 2020. I'm Mike Ryan. Today we catch up with One Nation Senator Malcolm Roberts and talk elections and water. Plus, Kirk Clyde joins us with his overview of the presidential elections. The LNP in Queensland is behind the reimagined plan to take excess flood water from North Queensland to provide drought relief in western and southern parts of the state. It's the new Bradfield scheme and from One Nation, Senator Malcolm Roberts. Uh, Malcolm, great to see you once again. Thank you, Mike. It's good to be back. Look, we're hearing much lately about the Bradfield scheme, uh, the modified Bradfield scheme, the hybrid Bradfield scheme uh, and other Bradfield scheme scenarios. Can you tell us about this and what we need to do about water in Queensland and what it could do for the state and the country? Sure. There, there are two really main factors. One is southern Queensland and southern western Queensland, and that's part of the Murray-Darling Basin. We can talk about that separately. The other one is the... Um, the, the Bradfield scheme, as you said, Mike, and that can bring water to many parts of Queensland, particularly the Flinders agricultural region, which I'll talk about more. But before we do that, and before discussing what the Bradfield scheme is, let's just be very clear about what's happened with the Bradfield scheme. It was developed in the 1930s by uh, Bradfield, who was the designer of the Sydney Harbour Bridge, an outstanding engineer. He walked all over Queensland, surveyed all over Queensland, and he came up with the scheme. Now, it's interesting. Pauline and One Nation have been pushing that consistently, consistently, consistently. 2017, Deb Frecklington said the Bradfield scheme is technically impossible. Bad idea. Not going to happen. We have stayed on it so hard and so relentlessly that she is now forced to adopt it. But the, Labor, the LNP is, is notorious for saying things and not following through. Now, the Labor Party, I'll give you some history on that. Um, the, in around about 2004, Peter Beattie was the premier and there was a strong, a, a deep, severe drought on. And so people raised with him the Bradfield scheme. He said, no, nah, no, nah, all rubbish. Don't worry about it. And then two years later, um, the drought was still on and he had to be seen to be doing something. So he commissioned a study on the Bradfield scheme. Now, in 2008, that, propo that proposal showed that it was viable, but nothing happened under Labor. Nothing happened under, under Campbell Newman. And if anyone was going to build it, was, it was Campbell Newman because he's a decent man. He's a civil engineer himself. He knows about this. My concern is that both parties are now saying they're behind it, Mike, but the Labor Party will never build it because the Greens won't let them. And they always pander to the Greens. The Greens set Labor Party policy. The LNP will either not build it because they're, they're, they have a history of lying on this matter as well, or... They will build an emasculated version and that will hinder the development of the real Bradfield scheme. So now to answer your question, the real Bradfield scheme was developed by uh, Bradfield himself and it involved damming the waters of the Tully, Herbert and uh, Burdekin rivers in, in the hinterland behind Cairns, Tully and to some extent Townsville and sending the water west into the Thompson and then into Lake Eyre, creating uh, wetlands in Lake Eyre which would change the weather and bring more water to Western Queensland and make it an agricultural uh, paradise. We don't see that. What we see is a hybrid scheme, modified scheme, and we see it this way. Damming the water on the Burdekin River, it's already got one dam on it, but then having two more weirs, and I'll explain the difference between a weir if you'd like me to later in a dam. Have, so we, what, the benefit of a weir is that it doesn't prevent the floodwaters from flooding the lower areas to, for the, the agricultural land that is. So what we do then is we have minimal impact on the environment, but then you can still capture water. The second thing, the reason why this is a modified Bradfield scheme or the hybrid Bradfield scheme is that we envisage hydro power being generated, about 10% of Queensland's power, just like the Snowy Mountains. So this is a much smaller scheme than the Snowy Mountains, much smaller impact on the environment, highly beneficial though for agriculture, and, and that's the damming of the of the Tully, Herbert and Burdekin rivers, uh, sorry, the, the moving of some of the water from those rivers into the Flinders agricultural region. And that would keep Queensland water then in Queensland? It would. Um, it could be built bigger mm -hmm. and then that takes some of that water to the Murray-Darling Basin. But what we envisage right now, I've been all over the Murray-Darling Basin, as you know, and we have come up with a plan that has five points in it that 
will enable the Murray-Darling Basin to take care of itself. The only external water it could possibly take is from the Clarence River. So we keep Queensland water in Queensland, and but we help because of the Murray-Darling Basin, the southern part of Queensland is in the Murray-Darling Basin. We could help that area just by better management of the resource, Mike. The mm. Murray-Darling Basin does not need water from Queensland, from North Queensland, because it, it just needs to be managed properly and honestly. Before the interview, you uh, mentioned that One Nation would build weirs and not dams. Can you explain the difference and why dams are not the way to go? Da well, dams are sometimes the way to go. It all depends on the circumstances. But what happens with these northern rivers is it's very seasonal. And, and so they flood in the, in the uh, wet season. And that cuts, uh, well, does a number of things. First of all, it, it spreads water throughout the water table. It also spreads water, uh, takes sediments and, and nutrients out into the Gulf for the prawn industry and the fishing and the fish and, and, the, and the aquaculture. So we have to make sure that that continues. So a weir just puts a block across the dam, uh, across the river, and the water can flow over it. it. It reaches a certain level and then flows over. So you still get the beneficial flooding but you still get the capture of water and you still get the elevation of water in, in, the, water in the water table, which means the, the water is stored in the soil and that's highly beneficial because that minimizes the evaporation. So where dam, are the, sorry, sorry, yep. no, keep going. I'll, I'll let you finish, sorry about that. One weir is on the Tully River uh, mm. near Kumbalumba mm -hmm. uh, and, and uh, the other one is on the Herbert River the Tully Weir would feed into the Herbert. The Herbert then would feed into the into the um, Hell's Gate Dam. So there's, there are two weirs and one dam. And the Hell's Gate Dam is already proposed by the LNP and by us over many years. And that would need to be built. It would also generate around about 1,000 megawatts of power. And, and that would be about 10% 10 of Queensland's gener uh, electricity needs. And the cost of the scheme would be about 8% billion dollars for the agriculture, five billion for the hydro, eight billion for the water infrastructure, five billion for the the um, the, the dam, uh, the hydro rather, and it would be paid back in a very short period and thereafter have a lot of profit. And remember, Mike, um, hydro generation is is very low maintenance, relatively low maintenance, and has a very long life lifespan. The snowy started being constructed 70 years ago and it's got many many years left and that generates now so um, it's a very feasible project where will the uh, new irrigation area be though malcolm west of townsville mike um and into the area say west of charters towns not charters towns but west of charters towns almost as far as as mount isa north to um four ways south to kainuna uh, and then east of uh, huendon it's a massive area and it's got it's got some of the best soil in the world, and I mean that, in the world. And at the moment, it's just used for grassy plains, for beef cattle, and it's seasonal because it depends upon the drought and depends upon the rainfall. Um, but we could, with irrigation, that soil would really flourish. It, is, it would, in fact, be better than the Murray-Darling Basin as a food bowl. It would support thousands of jobs, tens of thousands of jobs, and communities of tens of thousands in, in, the, in the area. It's a massive area. Um, I can I have to figure, get the, um, the uh, area here. It, but it's a massive area, very, very rich soil, and with enough water, which is available, would um, certainly um, power 20,000 square kilometres, and that's larger than the Murray, Valley, Murray River Valley irrigation area, um, and could contribute as much as $5 billion a year in agricultural and add value-added production. Mm. It sounds great. It's been compared to the Snowy Mountains project. Is this accurate? Yes, it is, but it's much, much smaller than the Snowy Mike. Uh, and that's important to understand, but it, it's rightly compared to it in terms of the scope, um, the, the, uh, the concept, um, and also in terms of hydro, in terms of beneficial for agriculture, beneficial for the environment, and, and also um, just generating wealth for the future for many, many years. The other thing is it's being compared because it's got tunnels linking the weirs and, and, uh, and the dam and diverting water into the Burdekin. But that, that in itself is, um, is similar to the Snowy, but the, it's much, much smaller than the Snowy, but the technology um, or the concept is similar, but the technology we have today is far, far better than it was back in, the 40, in 49 when the Snowy started. 
So this, this project is much more uh, reasonable, much more feasible than the snowy was back then than the snowy was feasible. So what's required then to, you know, it sounds great, but to make it a reality? Political willpower. What happens in this country, sadly, Mike, we've discussed this many times, is that ideology and emotion drive policy, not data. If this was decided on data, it would win easily and be up and run up and the construction would be starting in no time. What happens is we have the Greens ideologically opposed to dams. We have the uh, Labor Party then afraid to oppose the Greens and stand up to the Greens um, and essentially letting the Greens drive their policy. We have the LNP afraid for the sim same reason. And no one, none of these parties these days uh, go beyond the short term, the next 12 months or even sometimes the next few weeks to catch a headline. And so we need people with vision. None of the leaders in Queensland at the moment, Deb Frecklington or Anastasia Palaszczuk, is talking about anything visionary or showing any visionary leadership. What's needed is vision, what's needed is courage, what's needed is integrity, and what's needed is decisions based on data. And those, those are the reasons why the only way this is going to get built is if we elect more One Nation people into Parliament and put pressure through the crossbench on both the tidal parties. Besides the pressure on the feds, uh, how would you get the federal government involved? Well, the National Australia Infrastructure Fund is there, is available. Uh, someone came up with a good acronym. Let me see if I can remember it. Um, no, I, I can't at the moment. I'll, I'll see if I can find it. I had some notes here. Um, the National Infra Australia, Northern Australia Infrastructure Fund is um, $5 billion worth. It's, it's a fund available for building infrastructure in the north of Australia. Hardly any of it has been used, and that's what we need to, to tap into. Uh, we also need good business case. Queensland government is supposedly putting together a feasibility study and business case at the moment. Mm -hmm. So, a study rather, and and hopefully we can get something out of that. But what we need just is is the, some commitment from the national from the federal government, because they've already got the money that they could allocate. Uh, it would be a marvellous project for opening up the north. Deb Frecklington has promised the Bradfield in her election platform. Can you tell me why the National Party is pouring hot water on it? Because they know they're getting eaten alive in the bush with One Nation uh, taking their voters. Uh, we've been talking sensible policies based on data in terms of water, in terms of restoring farmers' rights to use the land that the Nationals and the Liberals stole from farmers in the Howard government and the Borbidge government back in 1996. And the National, um, national voters, uh, Nationals voters are at last waking up to this and they're abandoning the National Party. So the National Party has to grab hold of something. And they, they, they're stealing some of our policies because they're resonating with people. But the Nationals, I think, are beyond it because people now don't trust the Nationals. The Nationals, we've got Senator Matt Canavan running around the Senate, making speeches and, and voting for, making speeches saying that our carbon dioxide from burning coal affects the climate and needs to be cut. And, and, and supporting policies that show that are not coal driven and then goes back to Queensland and talks about coal. I mean, people can see this. People can see that what Matt is doing. He's, he's doing what Shorten did, saying one thing in the south and another thing in the north. People have had enough of that, Mike. Mm. They've had a gutful, and, and they want the truth. And we have been speaking consistently about the rights to use land and restoring those rights, about water security and about energy and about coal-fired power stations, consistently, consistently, consistently. And so the nationals are, are desperate now, and they've got to steal another one of our policies. What about the state election? Um, can you see a change of government at this stage? Um, you were mentioning before off camera, sorry about this, but the LNP is on the nose a bit in, in Townsville, for example. Um, yet Palaszczuk has done a, you know, I have to say, has done an appalling job of governing and really looking after the people, except for the, uh, the platitudes. You are absolutely correct. Um, it is muddied at the moment, as you know, uh, I've been on the ground in many areas of Queensland and it's muddied at the moment because some people think that Anastasia Palaszczuk has actually protected them and she's been strong. Far from it. She's been a coward and she's hidden behind the chief health officer and the chief health officer has admitted that the only thing that she has responsibility for is people's physical health. The Premier is responsible for the economic health, the mental health, the physical health. And while the Chief Health Officer has these restrictions in place, the, the economic deterioration of our state is terrible. And so we've got no one managing Queensland. So Anastasia Palaszczuk has been a coward. She's been hiding behind this, refusing to make decisions. 
She has not stepped up. She's let our, let our state wither. Now, some people think she's shown strong leadership because the chief health, the health officer has kept the borders closed. We should be making decisions based on data. And that data shows that northern New South Wales is not, not a source of COVID anymore. And so they, those borders should be open up. The Gold Coast should be thriving. Cairns should be thriving. They're not because of Anastasia Palaszczuk's gutlessness and, and, and dishonesty. Anastasia Palaszczuk has got a, a very effective campaign scaring people. And when people get scared, they tend not to think rationally. So she might just scrape home. However, what I'm hearing very strongly on the ground is that even LNP supporters are saying we need a change. We must have an LNP minority government. Get rid of Labor. That's got to happen. We have to get rid of Labor with their Greens policy. Put in place a minority LNP government with a very strong crossbench, particularly of One Nation. Because, and this is what LNP supporters are telling me, they don't have faith in Deb Frecklington or the LNP, but that would be better than the Labor Party providing One Nation is there telling them to get on with the job of fixing various issues like the, uh, the uh, labour policy of abortion right up until birth, um, which is basically murdering babies, uh, the, the water policies of One Nation, the energy policies of One Nation, the restoring of property rights that One Nation has been championing through our restoration or compensation. And, and these are the things that people want to see, but they, they know that Labour will never do it, with LNP, they wouldn't do it if the LNP had a majority government, but the LNP will be pushed into doing it if we have a strong crossbench dominated by one nation. And finally, uh, I can see that the, uh, the, the money that's been spent on the NBN is working very well. You're in, uh, in Canberra and uh, you would think the NBN would work perfectly there. We have uh, technology at its very worst almost, but we got through it. Malcolm, thank you very much. And we must do this again very shortly. Yeah, and one other point, Mike, I just mentioned that our country has a naturally highly variable climate and weather system. Mm -hmm. that, is in, that is so much more important to be building dams and weirs because when, when, the, when the rains don't come, we've got a deep water storage in the form of a dam or a multiple storage in the form of a weir. And that carries us through the dry periods. And that's how we drought proof Australia because our climate, our soil, is very, very good. The only problem we've got is highly variable climate, and, and that means low rainfall at times. So we have to overcome that, and that's why dams are so important, both within the Murray-Darling Basin and also up in, in the Bradfield Scheme. We've got to have dams to smooth out our highly variable climate. Malcolm, again, thanks for talking to us, and it's nice to see that the NBN was working probably out of 3 out of 10, I would give it. What, what would you give it? Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't go in above, above three. <laughs> I'll see you later. Thank you. But the politicians are still taking, but the uh, bureaucrats in Canberra are still taking home salaries of 800000 They are, but they need it. And they're, they're a good bottle of red. Very expensive these days. <laughs> Malcolm, <laughs> thanks. You, Mike. No, no, he's okay. No, no. Uh, no, no paramedics required. Not yet. Wait no. till Tuesday. No, no. Ah, Kirk, you're alive, are you? Yeah, I'm going old school. Remember, we've talked about uh, Sheldon Adelson's newspaper, of course, the big Republican contributor and, of course, the owner of Las Vegas Sands. They actually had a little bump for a while this week because the rumors are that Las Vegas Sands may sell all their Las Vegas properties, which would still leave them a big player in Asia, but kind mm. of a crazy situation. But last couple of days with the coronavirus situation, gaming stocks. Oh, my God. Oh. They've really taken a hit. But, you know, we don't stop here in Vegas. We know the good times will return. Cirrus, Circa is rather, Circa, it's the first new downtown Vegas hotel. They have this huge sports bar and big six-deck swimming pool. First downtown hotel to open in 40 years. Mm. That is some good news. But, of course, over the weekend, we just had unbelievable state coronavirus cases increase. Mm. Yes, it's even in Sheldon Adelson's newspaper that I pay 50 cents a week That's for. That's right. Now, stop, stop, stop. We've got to do something. Uh, I've got All to right. welcome you. And welcome to Kirk Clyde. We haven't, yes. we, see, we haven't done that. I was concerned about your health. And the oh, producer was right. saying, do we call a paramedic? You're alive. You're reading the yes. paper, which is great. Yes. Is it up? old school. Oh, that's fantastic. Now, what's happening with uh, with uh, the elections in the USA? Uh, 
Well, you know, we had, I was there yesterday. If you want to get an idea of just how crazy it is, and I'd love you to follow, like it or hate it, just follow. It's on Twitter, at Clients, my last name right there on the screen. Michael put it right there for you, at mm-hmm. Clients, C-L-Y-A-T-T. And it gives you a pretty good perspective of what's happening. Yesterday, well, I was enjoying a delightful afternoon in downtown Las Vegas with Kamala Harris, some of the up and coming Democratic local state politicians were there. Senator Jackie Rosen, who I worked for back in 2016 in her first campaign for Congress here in Nevada. She was there. She's really gotten fired up for the last uh, couple of years. So she's become a, a good politician for Nevada. So that was great fun. Kamala just getting the crowd ready to go. And, you know, you say, oh, Trump says, look at these huge crowds today, about 80 miles away from us, just across the river, the Colorado River in Bullhead City, Arizona, for another one of his super spreader events where people don't wear masks. They're packed in close together. The event I was at yesterday, very well organized by Nevada Democrats, had spaces for you to be every single person there wearing a mask. So the Democrats still getting in touch with the people but not spreading an infectious disease. And of course, last night, as we're recording this, that would have been Tuesday night, USA time, in Omaha, hard to believe, uh, Trump needs a campaign in Nebraska, but that shows you where his campaign is, right in the middle of the country, had the rally, he takes off on Air Force One, thousands of his spectators, they don't have buses to take them back to their cars. (laughs) So they have a whole bunch of the Trump supporters, especially the elderly. I think there were 10 to 12 cases of hypothermia. Yes, but they were piggyback, piggyback. And that's what Trump supporters do. They carry they carry the Uh, nation. Well, you know, I will say that the Trump core base is very monolithic. Mm. That's one of the problems the Democrats have always had. You go back to the era of Will Rogers, if you're a Broadway fan, or Will Rogers Follies was that big musical about, oh my gosh, 18, 20 years ago now. But he once said, I'm not a member of any organized party. I'm a Democrat. And that pretty much is the way things still are. Republicans, you know, they just monolith there. Democrats are all over the place and still in the past, well, even some today, but in the past have been a little bit too much touchy feely instead of going in hard on the issues. You used to have a saying, which you still do to some limited degree, but not as much because the Democrats have hit the gym and toughened up. It's like you don't go into a knife fight when your opponent has a switchblade and you have a butter knife doesn't really work out too well. What do you think will come of the Hunter Biden stories of Joe's involvement in his son's huge deals? Is it actually hurting him? Or actually, no. does, does he know that it's hurting him? I mean, I mean, I've seen Joe on stage here and there, and he, um, he really doesn't know a whole lot, does he? It's Kamala that will be pulling no. the strings. No, 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 no. But the Hunter Biden thing is, is a total smokescreen. The Republicans said about something You know, during all the four years of scandal of Donald Trump, it's a nothing burger. They're even Trump's allied media, Wall Street Journal, Fox News, have found nothing there. And with the pandemic cases just surging, give you some analysis for folks that are watching in Australia. Western Australia, just about COVID free. Nevada and Western Australia, about the same size and population. We had a thousand new cases here in Nevada and we're opening new casinos. That's in one day last weekend. So I think people are realizing, hey, wait a minute, this thing isn't getting any better. And that is what we're really focusing on. And look at Wall Street the last Mm. couple of days, not only the casino stocks, but Tuesday and Wednesday, U.S., just tremendous dumps. Uh, Wednesday, the market down over Mm. 900 points. So it'll be interesting to see. And of course, uh, I, I cannot, don't have his name in front of me. I'm just winging it this week. But the uh, author of the anonymous op-ed from back in 2018, he was the uh, chief of staff at the Department of Homeland Security, and uh, he came forward. And Mike, you will put his name right here on the screen. The guy, the author of anonymous was... <laughs> upside down. Right there. Upside right there. down. I'll put him so upside down. that's a pretty down. big news story. That's a pretty... So somebody who's right there on the inside mm. of the White House saw what's going on. And you look at the millions of dollars. Just look what's going on with the New York Times. The New York Times reporting that Trump did not repay, mainly to Deutsche Bank in Germany and some others as well, about $279 million of loans were just, poof, forgiven. That all came out in the tax uh, audit, the tax information that the New York Times received. Not really an audit, but just the digitized Mm. information of Mm. Trump's tax returns. So people know there are so, so many issues. His Mar-a-Lago resort 
receiving millions of dollars from the federal government for, say, catering events with Trump and other foreign officials and even other state officials. So Trump is charging the federal government three dollars to serve a bottle of water to himself at his resort in Florida. Pretty good way to make uh, pretty good way to make some money. And then you say, hey, but he's donating back his salary, like so many things in the Trump administration. Creative, creative it, accounting. That's what it's called. Uh, or, or a smokescreen trying to take advantage of every nuance of the system totally against everything that has gone forward in American presidential politics. But look at, uh, at uh, uh, COVID. I mean, it's, it's this, and then you're right, it's this disease that just um, won't go away. No. Um, look at France. I mean, even France, mm. I mean, sure, it's a fairly liberal sort of country, but they're shutting down the whole country now for, for a month. Uh, the problem with that is that it doesn't do business any good because if you're shut down and you keep being shut down, at the end of the day, uh, you ain't got a business. So what would you do? Well, I think you have to eradicate. You have to do what New Zealand has done. Uh, you know, I don't, Dan Andrews in Victoria, of course, that's been a tremendous struggle there to keep mm. that lockdown in place. But if it just keeps spiking over and over again, you're going to see a gradual economic collapse. I mean, people were celebrating here, for instance, yesterday in Las Vegas with one of the big local casino operators, Red Rock Resorts, reported earnings, and their earnings were only only down 24 percent so you're going to continue to see the travel and tourism industry just decimated mm. look at the gaming stocks the last couple of days just horrible so if we don't get control of the virus there will be no business people aren't mm. driving as much the travel and leisure industry the cruise ships forget about it when mm. are they going to get started again you have all these billions and billions of dollars of idle assets Look at a company like the big amusement park operator, mm. which uh, I just know their stock symbol. I think it's Cedar Creek Resorts or something, but I love their stock symbol. It's fun, F-U-N. But take a look at fun on the New York Stock Exchange and you'll see the last couple of years and now accelerating with the pandemic, a stock that used to be $75, $80 a share is now 25 And that is going to be the case with even more companies that aren't directly mm. affected by the tourism industry if the pandemic isn't brought under control. So I think that is clearly not only for France, but it was for New Zealand, where the prime minister there, of course, uh, re-elected overwhelmingly. But without disease control, there eventually will be no business. There will be no economy. Rioting in Philadelphia right. Right. and New York, yes. lots of looting. Which groups are organizing the riots? Is no, Black no, Lives no. Matter prominent in this? Or is this just a, a, a civil protest that got out of control? Well, I think it was a civil protest until the police came and started to just put everyone on edge. Uh, there's just so much video online, including on my Twitter feed, where my daughter was there and she's five foot six. She's a 30 year old, fourth year medical resident, basically there just to help. And she's getting shoved around by the cops. And she said, well, just take a look at the Twitter feed and you'll see some of the uh, the scenes that took place, Mike, you know, I even want to put up a couple of those, which were just horrific. And this is right in front of her out there. And I don't know the updated arrest count. Last I saw it was 156 arrested. So it's a horrible situation. But I think this is one of the stylings where too much of a show of force just causes a pushback. And as she said, she just saw so many cops that looked so eager to beat them up. Mm. And she also told me that the cops, too, have this. They're the ones with the power. They're the ones with the guns. They're the ones with the shields. They're the ones with the forces. There were at least 200 police officers uh, in her area last night. And yet she says they show fear. So we've got very fearful society taking place. And of course, these uh, protests slash riots, police induced riots, and uh, work because of a gentleman named Walter Wallace, 27 years old. He was having a mental health issue. His mother called for mental health services. The police arrived. He's got a knife. You've probably seen the video, but he's at least 10 feet away from him. This was not an effective way for the police to handle the situation. And that, similar to what happened with the George Floyd situation and others, that is what triggered this civil disturbance. And here, going into Wednesday night in Philadelphia, election time, of course, Pennsylvania, mm. the, probably this year, the key state. I have not seen any scenario, none, 
that allow Donald Trump to win the presidency without carrying the 20 electoral votes from Pennsylvania. So what you've got, and of course, if you watch this crazy show regularly, you saw me take the, the walk and talk tour a few weeks ago, and that was the neighborhood where this took place. So here you've got all these things happening. Voters need to get out. And yet tonight, as we speak, there is a curfew, a citywide curfew in Philadelphia. So folks are definitely on edge. Trump, of course, wants to send in federal forces. You've got the National Guard that has been called out there mm. by the governor in Pennsylvania, Governor Wolf. So it, it, we'll just see what happens tonight. Hopefully we'll have a quiet night this evening. But the police don't gun down a man who's in a crisis situation, leaves behind nine children, and, and gun him down in the street when he's clearly having a crisis. Sure, he's got a knife, but you have multiple police, and they are 10 feet away from him. His family members are trying to de-escalate the situation. We'll wait and see if the uh, police commissioner, who is an African-American woman, uh, with an interesting last name, Outlaw is her name there in Philadelphia, the police commissioner, if she does release body cam video mm. of this. So it's a similar situation to what happened with George Floyd. And you, of course, know the story about how everything that escalated. Let's hope this is not quite as a severe situation. Mm. But yes, uh, 150 at least probably more by now arrested in Philadelphia alone. Now, our next conversation, it'll be either uh, a teary Kirk. Actually, it'll be a yes. teary Kirk because he's sad or a teary Kirk because he's very happy. Um, very happy. A lot of the polls, a lot of the polls, as you mentioned, most of them are saying that uh, Biden will win this quite comfortably. Trafalgar, that, that poll that predicted that Donald would beat Hillary, and most others said it wouldn't happen, is predicting a Trump win. So do you think it's going to be an in-between, maybe a, uh, uh, say, a closer event than many are expecting? Well, we just don't know right now. I mean, there are there are three types of uh, races. You can have a very close race where it's just a switch in power. You can have a turnover or you can have a repudiation. And, you know, you have a close race, for instance, was like uh, when Clinton beat the first George Bush back in 1992. And then you have more of a turnover of power in 1980, where Ronald Reagan came in and just dismissed Jimmy Carter. And there was a turnover in Congress, too. And then you have a whole, what you'd call a repudiation, which took place in 1932, when Herbert Hoover was just crushed in the pool, polls and the election by uh, Franklin Roosevelt at the start of the Great Depression. And of course, I think there were 12 Senate seats that flipped that year, too. So probably it'll be one of those three. But looking at the latest odds, it looks like with the factoring in of the Electoral College, which is what it's all about, as we've spoken many times, there is not one man, one person vote here in the United States. It depends where you live. Right now, they're still factoring in an 11 percent, 11 percent chance that uh, you have Donald Trump win, 88 percent chance that Joe Biden wins. And what's that one percent left over? That is a tie, which means it would go to the House of Representatives, which I can get into it if you want the minutiae of how that would be decided. But that could lead to a very bizarre scenario because mm. the vice president is predict is picked in the Senate. So. There is a tiny sliver of a chance, probably better chance than winning Powerball, but less of a chance than taking a six sided dice and rolling one of the numbers. So somewhere in that range that it would be a tie in the House of Representatives because each state delegation has one vote. So a little tiny population wise, Wyoming has the same power as the entire delegation of California. It's crazy. But that because there are more Republican delegations in any states than there are Democrat delegations. Trump could be the president, but if the Democrats take the Senate, you could have Trump as president and Kamala Harris as vice president. Oh, that's almost as bad as Nancy Pelosi being president. I mean, it's you have got a really crazy system there with uh, the, the college system. Yes. But, you know, it's been around for 240 years, so I suppose... It, it's worked pretty well until about now. Uh, just a, as a sidebar, do you think social? Five, do you five, think? Let me just say, let me throw this in there, Mike. Five do you think? But do you th the nine justices? Yes, but the do you Supreme think Court, social media? Five, no, do you think social five, media? Five, no, five, no, five, one more question. Five, <laughs> five, all right, let me just say, then you ask okay, social media. Five, so, social five, media. 
Do you think social media <laughs> has has created a distortion? Oh, people live in their own reality fields. And five of the last of the nine justices on the Supreme Court appointed by presidents who lost, lost the popular vote. As to social media, <laughs> yes, of course. Everybody lives in their own reality field. Although I do we my do. best I do my best to look at the other side. As hard as it is, I can only take a limited amount, and I unsubscribe from a lot of Republican websites, and they still keep sending me the stuff. Because they love you. you they it. love you, yeah, Kurt. Sure. They love you. We, and the militarism. We, we know your vote's important. The, the Democrats are still, even in through this, still warm and touchy and feasy, feeling the Republicans, those people are our enemies! You know, but, they, they have a, a singular, monolithic message, and... And we shall just see what the American people do and how the votes get counted. You know, I believe there's one philosopher, I wish the name off the top of my head is gone, but who said something, it might have been an American poet. I think it might have been Mark Twain. I don't know. I'm sure one of the viewers does know, though. It says voting's important, but what really is important is who counts the votes. So we shall see. But generally, the election integrity in the United States has been pretty good over the years. Mm. Hopefully that will continue next week. I can't wait. In fact, I'm also nervous too. So I've stocked up with some margaritas here, uh, just to get the cheap stuff. But, you know, it's got to be Margarita Mike on uh, Tuesday or Margarita Mike on Tuesday. So whichever, I'll be happy or I'll be sad. Well, you you know what? I will will be checking to see what uh, edibles are on sale. At our local marijuana dispensary. So next week, I mean, I could, we could be just sailing. I'm bringing out my inner Christopher Cross. Sailing. And we'll play Bob Marley. Bob Marley in the background. Is this love? Is this love that I'm feeling? (laughs) All right, Kurt, great chatting. Uh, We'll do it again um, after the election. And uh, before we go, Ted wants to say bye. Goodbye, Ted. (laughs) Goodbye. Bye. 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 And that's it for BNAP Today, October the 30th, 2020. Have a great weekend and vote wisely. I'm Mike Ryan.